In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Matthew 24, 42. Here we're dealing with the doctrine of be alert. And the only way to be alert is to have the Word of God circulating in your stream of consciousness. If you do not have the Word of God circulating in your stream of consciousness, you cannot be alert. And this is, of course, for those living in the tribulation, and it is intensified in which they must really be alert. And they must know every doctrine concerning everything that they should do in order to run to the hills when the abomination of desolation is set up, and in order to fight when it is commanded for them to fight. But all of this comes from the Word of God, and it's something that they need to learn. And for us in the church age, we need to learn the Word of God, because when catastrophes hit us, the only thing that's going to help is the Word of God. So it, all of this is dealing with the fact that we need to be alert through doctrine. 2442, Therefore, watch. That's probably what the King James says. That's pretty good because it's dealing with a military watch. And uh, the military watch in the Roman Empire, if somebody fell asleep on the job, they would just light their robe and whoosh, they would burn up. And they would roll around and, uh, and put the flames out, but then they would go to trial and usually end up being burned alive anyway. So therefore, watch means be alert. And, and in fact, this word has many... Uh, different meanings. It means to be oriented, to be happy, to be satisfied, to be an island unto yourself. Now, how are you going to be an island unto yourself? How are you going to be happy? Now, being happy as an island unto yourself means that you're happy in spite of the fact that people attack you. You're happy uh, whether uh, the marriage is going well or not. You're happy whether your family life is good. You're happy whether your national life is good. You're an island unto yourself. And you're happy no matter who is president. And that's the principle. Uh, one we might not apply today, but maybe in the next few years we'll have to apply. So, uh, an island in yourself to be happy from the knowledge of the Word of God, and that's the only way. Therefore, watch, be alert, because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. This is dealing with the second advent. It's not dealing with the resurrection. We don't know when the resurrection is going to occur, by the way. And they have an approximate idea of when the second advent is going to occur. It's going to occur seven years after the resurrection, approximately around seven years after the tre uh, resurrection. But even then, no one knows the day or the hour when our Lord's going to come back. So the principle is to be alert through doctrine. Then 24, 43. But, though, but know this, if the good man, and I think the King James says, the good, the good man, and it refers to the father of the household, and the actual translation should be master, the father is the master of the household. If the master, this is a father in the tribulation who is ignorant of doctrine, He's the father of a family, ignorant of doctrine. <clears throat> if the master of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been alert and would have and would not have left his house to be raided. If the master, the father, uh, the father of a family in the trib in, during the tribulation, who is ignorant of doctrine, if he had uh, known what time of night the thief was coming, he would not. He would have been alert and would not have left his house to be raided. Now, there are some points that we need to take from this, and that is point one: this catastrophe 
was the result of not knowing what to do when the sign is given. And this is for the tribulation only. Signs are for the tribulation only. There are no signs for the church age. These signs are for the tribulation, and he should have been learning doctrine so that he would know what these signs were all about. When he saw the abomination of desolation being brought up in the middle of the temple, he should have took off running. But this is a father of a family, and even the King James says a good father. He might be a good father, but he has no doctrine. And he doesn't know that he needs to get moving. And so what happens is catastrophe. And this catastrophe was a result of this father not knowing what to do when the sign was given, such as the sign to run to the hills. Had no clue. Had no one probably never even read Matthew, uh, the verses we've been going over. Just didn't have a... He was a believer. He believed in Christ. Just didn't have a clue about the doctrine. So point two, catastrophe overtakes the ignorant believer. If you're ignorant of Bible doctrine and catastrophe hits, you're going to fall all apart. You're not going to know how to handle it. You're not going to have the divine operating assets. You're not going to be able to use the faith rest drill because more than likely, as a church age believer, you're not going to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And most believers today don't even know rebound. So how in the world are you going to deal with catastrophe? Let's say a catastrophe hits this country, one of uh, massive importance hits this country, and only uh, 1% or less than 1% of the believers know how to rebound. How are they going to deal with it? They won't. They will fall apart because catastrophe overtakes the ignorant believer. The believer who does not know Bible doctrine will eventually be overtaken by catastrophe. And that's a fact. And the truth is, all of us in life will face catastrophe. Whether we're winners or losers in the spiritual life, we will face catastrophe. Job faced catastrophe, and he was a winner and was able to handle it. However, others who face catastrophe, if they don't have the Word of God, how are they going to handle it? They're not. They're going to fall apart emotionally. They may go disukos, which means insane. And God uh, had turns their minds to madness because they've rejected the Word of God. And it, it doesn't even take catastrophe for that to happen. It just takes a simple uh, breakdown of not knowing the Word of God and therefore, due to rampant negative volition their whole life, God turns their minds to madness. Then, uh, point three, we all have catastrophic, catastrophic events in our lives. Point three, we all have catastrophic events in our lives. And the believer with doctrine can handle the catastrophic event. But the believer without doctrine is overtaken by the disaster. If you don't have doctrine and disaster hits, the first thing you're going to do is seek to blame someone else. And usually you seek to blame God. And after 9-11, I never heard such a gibberish out of a bunch of losers, except they kept asking, God, why did this happen? And they kept asking God, why did this happen to uh, our country? Why did, this, why did it happen? Well, there's no positive volition. But furthermore, you can't handle a, ca a catastrophic, catastrophic event. And the first person you want to blame is God when things go wrong. And it's really blasphemous, but that's the way the person without doctrine handles the situation. If you have doctrine, you rely on the Word of God. You rely on God. You rely on the doctrinal assets that He's given to us. If you don't have doctrine, you blame God and say the things, things are so terrible, it's God's fault. And many people go through that. Many people uh, marry the wrong person and then blame God for it. And it's a, t a terrible uh, blasphemy. But on top of that, it just shows that without Bible doctrine, you cannot handle not even normal life, much less a catastrophic event. When, point four, when catastrophe knocks on the door of someone who has not made Bible doctrine number one, they will fall apart. That's it. When catastrophe hits, they'll fall apart. Be destroyed. And they may live through it, but they're going to fall apart emotionally and they're going to be miserable because uh, they have not made Bible doctrine number one. Therefore, catastrophe hits and they have no divine operating assets. 
And they really haven't cemented in their mind what it means to use the four stages of the faith rest drill. And sadly enough for most of Christianity today, they don't even know how to rebound or to be filled with God the Holy Spirit, which is the most basic. And if you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, you're using all types of uh, human solutions to your problems. And the human solution is no solution. The divine solution is the only solution. Then in 2444... Therefore, become prepared. This is, this is in the imperative mood in the Greek. It's a command. Therefore, become prepared. This is something you must do yourself. It is a command. It is an order from God to become prepared. But the fact that you must do it for self is you can't prepare anyone else. Look at Noah the evangelist, who for 120 years stood outside. Well, first of all, he probably worked 12 hours a day building this a gigantic ship. I hesitate to say boat. It was a ship. And God the Holy Spirit gave him the specifics for building it and constructing this gigantic ship that would be able to withstand 200-foot waves, etc., and so he was out there building this ship, and people would walk by, ha, 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 and laugh at me, mock him, what are you doing? And then he would give up and uh, give a sermon. You need to believe in Christ. By the way, there's a flood coming. Catastrophe is coming, and you need to believe in Christ. And then if you do, you'll be able to come on the ship with me. And they just laughed at him and ridiculed him for 120 years. Nothing but ridicule was sent to Noah for 120 years because he was telling them the truth. That 120 years means that God sends uh, much grace before judgment. And all of these people had 120 years of grace, 120 years of warning. Therefore, become pre prepared and you must do it yourself. Noah tried his best to get everyone else to be leaving. But no one did. But at least he did it himself. And through positive volition, so did the other members of his family. Four, go four girls and four boys. Eight, uh, eight, including them all. Because the Son of Man will come at a time when you least expect Him. This is dealing with the second advent. And the Son of Man, even though uh, approximately seven years will pass from the time of the resurrection to the second advent, it's still going to come as a surprise, especially to those who have no doctrine, and uh, extremely uh, especially to those who have not believed in Christ. So there's some principles out of all of this. No one is prepared for catastrophe by a one-shot decision. Just because you go to a church and you uh, dedicate yourself to the Lord. A lot of people do this. They walk down the aisle and they say, I've dedicated myself to the Lord. I've made a lifestyle change. I am going to serve the Lord. No one is prepared by a one-shot decision. Point one. No one is prepared by a one-shot decision. Point two. No one is prepared by having a human viewpoint, change of lifestyle. And a lot of people have degraded Christianity to the point where uh, you're a Christian if you've changed your lifestyle to being good rather than bad, whatever that means. And uh, especially in the South, uh, you're going to be good as a little girl because uh, you're not going to go out in bars and you're not going to drink and you're not going to fornicate. And you're not going to get involved in all of the uh, licentious sins. Therefore, you think you've had a change of lifestyle. Maybe that's the way your parents went. And you say, I'm not going that way. But you go the other way. But it doesn't mean you're saved. And if you are saved, it doesn't mean you're spiritual. So no one is prepared by having a human viewpoint change of lifestyle. Point three. No one is prepared by becoming legalistic. A lot of people become legalistic, just as they were in the times of the Jews, in the times of Israel before they went under the fifth cycle of discipline, and they would go out in the street and see all the sinners, and they would say to themselves, thank you, God, that you didn't make me like these sinners. And they would pray that to God. 
Then the fifth cycle came, wiped them out, and they went to hell because they never believed in Christ. So they weren't prepared for the catastrophe. The only people who are ever prepared for catastrophe are those people who make Bible doctrine number one. And not just a a one-shot decision. Not just uh, every Sunday. Not just twice on Sunday and Wednesday. You must make Bible doctrine number one. Day after day after day after day. And it's that simple. And uh, if you get the Word of God and you put it in your soul and you uh, love to take in the Word of God and you start to use it in your life, you're going to make it. And you're going to make it through any catastrophe. But if not, you won't make it. And you won't make it through the catastrophe. You'll fall all apart. Now I understand there's some days that uh, we don't feel like coming to church or listening to the Word of God. There are some days I don't feel like getting up and speaking. Today was one of them. I didn't even feel like uh, being here, but it's my duty, so I came here. And, uh, well, we all get that every now and then. We get in, maybe we don't feel so good, or we, we're in a tired mood, or we've been uh, worn out, or something like that. Uh, but it takes self-discipline, of course, to make sure that Bible doctrine is number one in the life, in your life. Now, some days I'm raring to go. Some days I get up in the morning and I'm uh, doing my studies and I, I can't wait to get to church and just uh, and just preach and just tell them what I just uh, found from Scripture. And some days are like that and other days I feel kind of uh, down and out. It's normal. It's a normal part of life, uh, the, the ups and downs of life. But still, but see, I've already had my doctrinal intake for the day. Uh, before I even get up here. And so I get up here and preach, as that is my job. And therefore, what we have from all of this is the fact that it takes simple self-discipline. Everything in life takes self-discipline. Back when I worked out, and I think I'll probably start working out again because I need to for health reasons, but back when I used to work out, there would be days I didn't want to. And I remember me and my dad would work out all the time. And we would go down to the Y in Spartanburg and we would run. Now the hardest time for running is in cold, dry air. Or just plain cold air because it makes your lungs ache. And we would run a mile uh, every time. Well, probably about every other day. We would run a mile and then work out. And this one day it had snowed and it was cold out. Yet we still ran the mile and uh, and none of us really felt like it. And one time I was uh, pretty doggone sick and didn't feel like it. And my dad said, look, just do it. It might make you feel better. Open up those lungs. Let's go running. And that was back when he was in better shape too. So we would do it. And at first you don't feel like it and you're, oh man, got to do this again. But then once you get through with it, you feel better afterwards. But all it has to come down to is self-discipline. And the self-discipline to do it even though uh, you don't feel like it, to do it, even though uh, you would rather do something else. I would rather now be eating chicken and watching a movie, probably. Uh, Jambalaya, is that what you're making? Yeah, that sounds good, and that's what I'm going to be eating. And then I'll watch a movie, but after I finish what I need to be doing here, and that's all about self-discipline, and it's important to have in order to handle the catastrophe. Because under the catastrophe, all that self-discipline and all those times you came when you didn't want to come and all those times you listened when you didn't feel like it are there going to be those times that you'll start recalling what was said and you will be able to handle the crises. Now we move to the faithful and wise slave in 25 or 24, 45. Who then is wise? That is from doctrine. Who then is wise from doctrine? Who then is wise and a faithful servant, whom the master has put in charge of his household? That means to be put in charge of evangelizing. So who then is wise from doctrine? Who then is wise and a faithful servant, whom the master has put in charge of his household, in charge of evangelizing, to give the other servants their food? The food refers to, well, first of all, you got the water of the word, the gospel. 
salvation. The faithful and wise are, are out in the tribulation giving the gospel. The faithful and wise in the tribulation are giving the gospel and also giving food, giving the message of the word of God. And they're doing it at the proper time. And they're going around, uh, that probably would be part of the 144,000, going around giving the gospel and also giving the pertinent doctrines so that uh, they can know when to run. And they'll have a, 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 a ad hominem type churches built during the tribulation. And it won't be a church per se, but the, the people will get together and they will say, Hey, the abomination of desolation has been built. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew. Let me tell you now, Matthew says it's time to run. Let's get running and we'll go up into the hills and then I'll tell you more. And stuff like that will occur. And then in 2426, or 2446, that servant whom his master finds doing this, when he returns, will be blessed. In other words, will be rewarded. He will be rewarded because uh, when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, here's this fellow been running around giving the gospel, giving doctrine, trying to get people prepared for the catastrophe, just as Noah did, except Noah had no converts. These people are going to have at least a few converts. Noah's had none. And they're going to be running around seeking for people to believe in Christ and seeking for people to learn the doctrine so that they can run up into the mountains. And when the Lord comes, and, and that is when He comes at the second advent and sets His foot on the earth, these people will be recognized by the Lord and will be blessed and rewarded. 24.47 A point of truth for your benefit. He will put him in charge of all of his possession. This has to do with reward. And the believer in the tribulation who executes the plan of God as it is then and who has been out uh, of learning doctrine, has been learning doctrine, not only learning doctrine, but teaching others and giving them the gospel, they will receive reward as a result. Then 2448. But if that evil servant, the evil servant deals with the Jew, the unbelieving Jew, this Jew has not believed in Christ, and if he says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. In other words, they might be five, six years into the tribulation, and all the other people, all the other Jews who are saved have been, have been talking about how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and set everything straight. And then what's going to happen is the unbelieving Jew is going to say, my master's staying away a long time. He doesn't believe it. He's going to say, yeah, he's not coming back. Fifth, sixth year into it, maybe even the seventh year into it, uh, that all this is a bunch of hogwash. There is no Jesus Christ coming back. They never believed that he came in, in the first place. He's not going to come in the second place. So uh, what they do is 2449. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and to live it up. What happens during this time is a great deal of persecution of those who believe in Christ, especially those Jews who believe in Christ. And there will be Jew against Jew, and the unbelieving Jew will begin to beat his fellow Jew who has believed in Christ. And how will they know? Well, some of these Jews will come out and say, you need to uh, believe in Christ. Or, the Son of God is uh, coming soon, you need to believe in Him, and they won't believe Him. They'll say, ah, oh, this has never happened before. I didn't believe it the first time that He came the first time. I'm not going to believe that He's going to come the second time. It's just not going to happen, and you're crazy. And then they start to blame all the problems in the tribulation on the believer and start to beat the crap out of the believer and actually persecute the believer. So, he beats his fellow slaves and lives it up. In other words, gets drunk. You see, times are rough, but alcohol is always going to be available, even when times are rough. And that's one of the things that happened in New Orleans uh, when uh, nothing else was available. They all busted into the liquor sh liquor stores, and there were uh, drunk robes of men everywhere, drinking liquor. 
And that's the way it's going to be in the tribulation, even though it's going to be such a, a terrible time. There's still going to be liquor, and they're just going to live it up and uh, persecute the believer. 2450. That slave's master will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not foresee. He doesn't expect it, nor does he foresee it, because he didn't even believe that Christ came the first time in the first advent. So how in the world is he going to believe that he's going to come in the second advent? He just doesn't believe it. 2451. The master will inflict extreme punishment and assign him to a, and then sign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the baptism of fire. This is when those unbelieving Jews, right now we're dealing with unbelieving Jews. What do you need? The translation again of 51? The Master, Jesus Christ, will inflict extreme punishment and assign him, the unbelieving Jew, to a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a description of the baptism of fire. And right now we're dealing with Jews being separated from Jews, the unbelieving Jews being cast into the lake of fire while the believing Jews move into the millennium. There will be believing Gentiles as well who will go into the millennium. And there will be unbelieving Gentiles who will go into the baptism of fire. But right now we're dealing with the Jews specifically. Later on in uh, Matthew we deal with Gentiles as well. So what we have is the judgment. The judgment of the unbelieving Jew during the tribulation. And that judgment will be the baptism of fire in which they will be uh, thrown into the lake of fire. Now there are seven major judgments in history. There are seven major judgments in history. Number one, Christ was judged for us. There are seven major judgments in history. Number one, Christ was judged for us. All the sins of all of the entire world from uh, the time of Adam and Eve all the way until the time of the last person in the millennium, all of those sins were gathered up and poured out on Christ and judged. The greatest judgment ever, Christ was judged for us. Number two, there is the judging of ourselves. The judging of ourselves is uh, listed in 1 Corinthians 11.31. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. This is referring to the rebound technique. And when you judge yourself, you say, I have uh, committed this sin, therefore I'll name it. It is the opposite of self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. So again, judging ourselves, 1 Corinthians 11, 31. And when we judge ourselves, that is the equivalent of rebound. Only thing you're doing is naming your sin to God. That's judging yourself. Instead of justifying yourself, you say, you know what? I did sin the other day. I did get drunk. I did do whatever. And you name it, that's judging yourself, and you're forgiven. Instead of justifying what you did and saying, I got drunk because my uh, wife's a witch, or, or whatever, that would be justification. Uh, and that would be the opposite of self-judgment. Self-judgment is rebound. That's 1 Corinthians 11.31. Then number three. Number three is not really a judgment, uh, but uh, we'll list it in the seven judgments, and that is the evaluation, the Bema evaluation. This is when every believer will be given an efficiency rating. Most believers will have an efficiency rating of zero. They'll believe in Christ, but they'll never learn how to rebound. They'll never learn how to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. They'll never take an interest in the Word of God. So their efficiency rating will be zero, and they will have shame in a resurrection body. That's under the Bema evaluation. You can call it a judgment, because if you have shame in a resurrection body, that's pretty bad. That's judgment on you for not living your spiritual life. But you will be in heaven. Remember, you do not lose your salvation. 
Then there is the number four and five. Number four and five deal with the baptism of fire. Number four, judgment of living Gentiles in the tribulation. That's found in Matthew 24, dealing with the baptism of fire. Judgment of living Gentiles in the tribulation, the baptism of fire. Now, some of these Gentiles will believe and they will not go through the baptism of fire. Most will not believe and most will go through the baptism of fire, Matthew 24. <clears throat> Actually, I change that to Jews. It's judgment of living Jews in Matthew 24. Judgment of the living Jews who have not be believed in Christ in Matthew 24. The Gentile is mentioned in Ezekiel 20. This is point five. There will be the judgment of the living Gentiles for the baptism of fire, and that's found in Ezekiel 20. Matthew 24 deals with the Jew baptism of fire. Ezekiel 20 deals with the Gentile baptism of fire. Then number six, we have all the fallen angels being judged and sent to the lake of fire. All fallen angels judged and sent to the lake of fire along with Satan himself. Number six. And number seven, all mankind is judged. Number seven, all mankind is, is judged. That is, all mankind who did not believe in Christ will be judged and sent to the lake of fire. So again, we have number one, Christ was judged for us. Number two, we judge ourselves through the rebound technique. Number three, the Bema evaluation. Number four, the judgment of the living Jews during the tribulation found in Matthew 24. Number five, the judgment of the Gentiles through the baptism of fire found in Ezekiel 20. Number six, all fallen angels will be judged. And number seven, all mankind will be resurrected and judged at the last judgment. And that's found in Revelation. And so we have the baptism of fire, and there's something we need to know about the baptism before we continue. And we've studied baptism before, but uh, we, we'll go ahead and get it again because it's important to have repetition, and we've probably forgotten already. There are seven uh, baptisms found in Scripture. There are seven baptisms found in Scripture. Four of these baptisms are real baptisms. Three of these baptisms are ritual baptisms. Baptism is a Greek word which has unfortunately been transliterated into the English language. And transliterated means is uh, uh, some guy looked at baptizo in the Greek, B-A-P-T-I-D-Z-O, and looked at it and said, hmm, baptism. Well, it really has no meaning for us. What's baptism mean? It means to be identified, and that's the translation, to be identified with, etc., so baptism is a Greek word. It should have never been transliterated. It has caused a lot of confusion today. And a lot of people, uh, the only question they have concerning a church is, what is your method of baptism? I'll go there if you dunk them, or I'll go there if you sprinkle them. And it's uh, really ridiculous because there's no understanding of what baptism really means. And it all goes back to the 9th century B.C. Homer. And he used the word baptizo, for Cyclops. And what happened with Cyclops is uh, one of the fellows uh, had a very hot uh, steak, like you would have heat in a fire, and they heated it up and went <laughs> right through his eyeball. And uh, uh, Homer uh, described the hissing sound of that thing going through his eyeball. And he called that baptizo. And that means uh, he was identified with uh, this this uh, metal iron hot thing that went through was identified with it. He was changed afterwards, in other words. After being identified with it, he was changed. He was blind in one eye. And it, it changed him for life after being identified with the hot iron. And they usually used it for uh, putting the hot iron in water. And that's how they would change it, because the, the smith would uh, heat up the metal and beat out the sword or beat out the spear, or whatever he was trying to make. And then it would be bright red, of course. You really couldn't tell what it was. And then he would go, whoosh, put it in the water, 
And when it was identified with the water, when he pulled it back out, it was changed and it was a sword. Before, it was a hot piece of metal, went into the water, was changed into a sword, identified. And that is where the word baptism uh, came from. There's another one also in which... uh, uh, the uh, some of the Spartans, by the way, uh, they had built uh, a lot of spears, brand new spears. And the only way that the, it could be a warrior spear is if it had blood on the tip of it. But they weren't going to use their own blood, of course, and they weren't going to stab each other. So they would sacrifice a pig, they always did, put the blood in a big boil, a bowl, and then the, the, the people would go by who were going to war and dip the uh, spear into the blood. And when they did, it was identified with the blood, and when it came out of the blood, it, it was a warrior spear. Before, it's just a spear. They put it in the blood, it's identified with blood, now it's a warrior spear. And that is where identification came from, or baptizo came from, and that's its etymology. Now we have the uh, four different uh, baptisms listed in the Bible. There are seven There are seven baptisms, four real and three ritual, but we have the uh, four baptisms, the main baptisms listed in Scripture, and we have the baptism of Moses, number one. And Moses was identified with Christ. Remember the pillar, the cloud, the pillar of the cloud there. He was identified with Christ. And the children of Israel, the two million of them, were identified with Moses. And notice there was no immersion of the Jews or Moses. No immersion in water. They went. They walked through on dry ground. The only people identified with water in that would be the Egyptians who all were killed and sent to hell. But uh, this baptism had nothing to do with water. It was a dry baptism, and it has to do with the baptism of Moses. It simply means that uh, Moses was identified with Christ, and the children of Israel were identified with Moses, meaning that uh, he was their leader, and they were identified with their leader, Moses. Even though they, they always rejected him, uh, they were identified with him through this case. We have the baptism of the cup mentioned in Matthew 20 through 22. And this is where our sins were poured out on Jesus Christ and judged. And therefore, it's called the baptism of the cup. Then we have, number three, the baptism of the Spirit. And the baptism of the Spirit, uh, this is where we're put into union with Christ. And that occurs when we believe in Christ. When we believe in Christ, we receive the baptism of the Spirit, and that puts us into union with Christ. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. I go over this quickly because we went over this in the basic series, or the essential series. Then number four, we have the baptism of fire. And the baptism of fire is found in Matthew 3.11 and Luke 3.16. And that's where the unbelieving Jew and the unbelieving Gentile of the tribulation is uh, identified with fire uh, by their judgment for not believing in Christ. <clears throat> now we have uh, uh, some other things to look at, and that is the baptism of John. Remember John the baptizer. And uh, he would uh, put uh, people under the water. This would be the ritual. I just gave you the four that were not ritual that occurred. They, those were real. Baptism of Moses, real. Baptism of the Spirit, real. Baptism of fire, real. All of those were real. Now we get to ritual baptism. And there's one more that's real as well. Uh, the baptism of the cup, of course. Jesus Christ dying as a substitute for us on the cross and our cup being the sins being poured out on him. All those were the real baptisms. Now here are three that are ritual. And we have John the baptizer who baptized people. And he would put people under water. And this was identification with the kingdom with, of which John preached. John preached of the kingdom, and he preached of the kingdom of the regenerate. And coming out of the water is the picture of the fact that they possess eternal life. And that was John the baptizer preaching the kingdom. Most of these were Old Testament type believers. And they had listened to John the baptizer. Jesus Christ hadn't even been around yet because John the baptizer was paving the way. And they would listen to John the baptizer, believe in Christ, and be identified with the kingdom. And a lot of these uh, people died before our Lord even went to the cross. 
So they would be identified with the, uh, they would go under the water and be identified with the kingdom and come up and uh, be identified as saved. And that's why he said, change your mind, change your mind, change your mind about Christ. And they did, and that would be, they became the kingdom of the regenerate. Then we have a unique baptism, and that's the baptism of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was put under the water, and that represents the will of uh, the Father that Jesus Christ go to the cross. He was dunked under the water, and that represented the will of Jesus of God the Father that Jesus Christ go to the cross. And also, uh, the fact that uh, Jesus was willing to be baptized, it shows that he had positive volition. He expressed positive volition with regard to the cross and was saying, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. And he did it through the ritual of being dunked under the water by John the baptizer. The water represented the cross and, of course, all of our sins being poured out on him on the cross. When he came up out of the water, that was a representation of the resurrection. So, that was the unique baptism of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have the baptism of believers. And believers today still go through ritual baptism. It is not a requirement, however, for us to do so. You may have done so, and if you're a Baptist, you probably did. Uh, there's no commandment against it, but there's no commandment telling you you should. In fact, the Apostle Paul regretted baptizing uh, but uh, if you've been baptized, so what? It's just a ritual. And if you knew why you were being baptized, it, it could be ritual with reality. But it's not. The only ritual that is commanded for us now is the uh, te the communion, and for us to have communion. And but in the pre-canon, that means before the scripture was completed, they did have the ritual of baptism. And that was a, it was used as a teaching tool. They did not have the completed canon of Scripture, so they had the teaching tool of baptism. And so we have the baptism of the believer of the pre canon church age. They still do it today. Sadly enough, they don't know what they're doing when they do it, and they make a big issue out of it, and it's become more of a distraction today than it has any of any spiritual value. It's, it's a ritual, and that's all it is. If you understand the ritual and you did it, then you under, that means you understand doctrines about as far as it goes. But there's nothing holy attached to it, and nothing meaning you're a great person for doing it. And it was done in the pre-canon church age as a teaching tool. Now, how did it work? Well, the believer going into the water is saying, by going into the water, I reject all human good and I am identified with Christ. By going into the water, he's saying, I believed in Christ, I'm rejecting all human good. And he is identified with Christ, who went in the water and was judged, of course, for all of our sins by doing so. And so he was judged for all of the sins, you go into the water saying, I reject human good, I'm identified with Christ. As the believer comes out of the water, he's identified with the air. And being identified with the air means he has current positional truth. He is in union with Christ forever. Simply an association in which he knows he's in union with Christ forever. Now, of course, I'll say again, this is not a ritual requirement for us in the post-canon period of the church age. It's not a requirement for us to be baptized. My pastor even uh, baptized people when he had first got started, but he knew what it meant, and he made sure that the people he baptized knew what it meant, and he would baptize them in the Pacific Ocean uh, out in California, and, uh, and that water's cold, by the way. That water is frigid. I don't see how they did it, but he would take them out there, and a wave would come and boom, go under and bring them up. But he made sure he knew what they were. He he made sure that they knew what was going on and what it meant, and it meant that they were being identified with Christ, that they were in union with Christ. So if you did the ritual, and if you've done the ritual, there's nothing to feel ashamed of. It's just a ritual, though. It has no meaning. The only ritual that has meaning today is, of course, the communion. Now, tomorrow night, we'll start with the parable of the ten virgins. And the, t the parable of the ten virgins, along with the parable of the talents, are there to teach the baptism of fire. The parable of the ten virgins 
uh, teaches the baptism of fire to the unbeliever, the parable of the talents uh, gives us an indication of not only unbeliever, but believer and believer who receives reward for learning the Word of God. Now that's tomorrow night if it's raining. Right? Tomorrow's Friday, right? If it's not raining and they're having football in Greenwood, I guess that's where we're going, right? Well, if it's raining, we'll be here. Maybe the Lord will send rain or maybe shine. We'll see what happens. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.